Welcome to this episode of Birds and Bites brought to you by the Chicago Ornithological Society. Tonight's episode is on bird rescue, rehab, and release. My name is Christina Harbour and I'm with the Chicago Ornithological Society and I will be your host for this evening. Just a few quick announcements before we get started. Uh, tonight's program is being recorded so you can watch it again on our YouTube channel if you'd like. If you have any questions for our presenters, you can send those to us in the chat. We'll try to get to those at the end after all four speakers um, have presented. Um, and then also, please keep yourself on mute for the duration of the presentation. If you do need to ask a question verbally at the end, you can unmute yourself and we'll let you know to do that. Um, otherwise, please keep yourself muted. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for tonight. First, we have Annette Prince, the Director of Chicago Bird Collision Monitors, who will speak about the bird rescue efforts of the CBCM. Next, we'll have Sitlali Favela, who will talk about their experience as a CBCM volunteer. And then we'll move on to the bird rehabilitation process. And Justin Sharp, from, who is the Wildlife Care Supervisor at Willowbrook Wildlife Center, will talk about the rehabilitation program there. And finally, Stephanie Skirtu will talk about their experience as a volunteer at Willowbrook. Annette, I'll hand it off to you to start. Okay. Is that working for everybody? Yes? Thumbs up? Okay. Yes. All right. Well, uh, thanks. My name is Annette Prince, and I am the director and president of Chicago Bird Collision Monitors, an organization that began as a grassroots project in 2003. Uh, we were founded by Robbie Hunsinger at a time when there were growing concerns about the damaging impact that artificial lighting uh, at night was having on birds. Uh, in the late 90s, conservation groups in the city of Chicago created a volunteer program called Lights Out Chicago, which is one of the most successful uh, programs in, um, in the country that, that was a, a pretty effectively uh, uh, having a volunteer effort to turn out as much top bright display lighting as possible, such that the city uh, uh, wasn't attracting birds uh, who are migrating at night. Uh, the bright lights on antennas and signs uh, are uh, light that pours up into the sky and it has a fatal attraction for, for birds coming in. But not all buildings were participating and there were nights when uh, buildings would leave their lights on and we could find hundreds of birds dead at a single building. So uh, Robbie uh, Hunsinger, and Ken Wysocki, who I, I think was a, a member of Chicago Ornithological Society at that point, started monitoring downtown, uh, recovering dead and injured birds to make connections with building management to let them know that uh, the simple act of participating and turning their lights out from 11 p.m. until sunrise was going to uh, just in itself uh, save thousands of birds from um, from colliding with buildings. Um, uh, that's Robbie Hunsinger there on the on the right of the screen. And <clears throat> And um, dozens of folks, as many, again, from Chicago Ornithological Society were some on the first monitoring teams that joined uh, two, two or three people maybe went out each day uh, or each morning uh, to look for birds. And as two people covering all of downtown, it was uh, people kind of running everywhere you could to find as many birds as possible. Um, I attended a presentation in 2004 and started volunteering and uh, I became director in 2005. So we've continued on and this, we are just completing our 20th year. It's gonna be our 20th anniversary and our project has grown to uh, from the dozen volunteers that, that were there at the beginning to over 200 people. Um, we also work with buildings downtown, uh, continuing to get more light reduction uh, besides the lighting that's on the top of the buildings. We're working with buildings to um, have their lobby lights turned out because a bird in a dark downtown area that sees attractive fountains, trees, um, landscaping on the inside of a building doesn't realize that there is a deadly invisible wall between them and flying toward the trees. So we've gotten uh, connections with uh, buildings to uh, reduce the, the sort of things that will, will hopefully prevent more uh, bird strikes happening. So as I said, our group has grown to more than 200 people, everything from, uh, from uh, families with their children uh, that are participating. We've got homeschooling moms coming with their kids. We've got uh, people who work downtown. We've got uh, people who are working, people who are retired, uh, who started out as what we used to call the few, the proud, the crazy, uh, and are now a, a, a force of people that are, that are heading out there. And just this year we became our own 501c3 uh, organization. So we are a public charity uh, and uh, are now, um, able to uh, operate and uh, 
um, as, as, a, as, a, as our own not-for-profit. And uh, we rely completely on volunteers. We're volunteer-led as well as uh, uh, funded solely by the donations of the public and organizations uh, throughout the Chicago area that help us out. Our work involves, besides what I'm gonna talk about tonight, which will be the, uh, the rescue uh, portion of what we're doing. We're also involved in education, uh, uh, public events, uh, tabled events, um, uh, giving uh, classes to architects and developers and community uh, organizations that wanna learn how to make buildings bird friendly. And we do consultations with uh, both homeowners as well as bigger projects like the Obama Center and the upcoming casino that's gonna be planned. We work together to uh, let them know uh, our understanding of how they can make these buildings safer and make sure that since Chicago is such an important area for bird migration, uh, we can have outstanding architecture, but also have it protecting birds. When we monitor uh, in the spring, we've got a season that begins in mid-March uh, and goes through early June. And in the fall, we start in late August and go to mid-November. We tend to start about a half an hour before sunrise and stay out generally up until about nine o'clock or maybe as late as 10. And certainly on busy days, we've monitored for the entire day. As long as birds are coming through, we've, we've had some days that we monitored from six in the morning until six at night because of heavy, heavy days of migration. As you can see from this uh, a chart, uh, we find uh, birds, uh, less birds in the spring than in the fall, because in the fall, uh, bird populations are at their highest. So you're, you're seeing birds, uh, the, both the parent birds and all their offspring are coming through. By the springtime, uh, there's been an attrition of, of the bird population. Things have died during fall migration, during wintering uh, uh, times in, on, their, on their winter grounds. Uh, and birds have uh, you know, met with hazards all the way uh, through their uh, southbound migration and their migration back north by the time they get to Chicago. Uh, in the springtime, uh, it, it's really the remaining birds. And even though we find less birds in the spring, those birds are really critical and important birds because they are what's left. They are the winners. They are the best survivors. Uh, they are the, the best uh, migrators. And uh, it's even more dismaying to see them um, being hurt as they almost made it to Wisconsin or Canada where they were heading. We are out uh, before sunrise because we're trying to get ahead of other hazards that uh, these birds who have hit the windows are laying uh, helpless stunned on the ground. And maybe if in your backyard a bird has hit your window, they can maybe sit for that hour's time it takes for them to recover. But downtown, uh, they are laying in streets on sidewalks where they're gonna be stepped on by commuters, where they're gonna be run over by cars, where uh, janitors are gonna sweep them up and where uh, a set of predators have, have really learned to look for them. The crows and gulls, uh, once the sun comes up and there's visible light for them, are circling the buildings and coming downtown to grab these birds, whether they're dead or alive. And we're trying to get out ahead of any birds that happen to be hurt and on the ground before something worse happens to them. Uh, we've got rats. Uh, we even had a very opportunistic raccoon that had uh, found that one building that if he just hung around this one building, he was finding uh, birds in the evening and early morning hours. So uh, we're trying to get these birds before something worse happens to them. We're checking the weather, which uh, bird watchers are doing as well to understand whether uh, a day is going to be a good day for migration and for being able to watch birds. But we are also aware that heavy nights of migration are going to happen in the fall when there's a north wind that are bring, that is helping birds to move in larger numbers. And in the spring, we're always uh, trying to be aware to have a a robust team on a morning when there's a, a wind from the south, which will be bringing a larger number of birds. We're also aware of nights when there's heavy cloud cover or fog, things that birds who normally would navigate by using the stars and the moon above them, they're, they'll be flying below cloud cover and more vulnerable to light attraction and coming down into dangerous urban areas. We cover an area that's about a mile and a half square from about as far south as uh, Ida B. Wells, going up about as far north as the Hancock, and from the lakefront over to areas west of the Chicago River. Um, we cover as much ground as possible. We expand if we have more people. We know that this is not the only place in Chicago where birds hit buildings, but we know that this is uh, an area that we can efficiently cover 
and um, be able to operate uh, our, our collection, rescue, uh, and salvage uh, matters in. As we've gotten more people uh, and more volunteers, our teams that, like I said, initially were maybe a couple people that would try to run throughout this whole area in a car, finding anything they could spot. We now can have a team from eight to 16 people out, uh, you know, every morning of the, of the migration season, uh, covering uh, routes as often as they can, uh, as many places uh, repeated uh, because you can be leaving a building and a, burden, uh, a building just as you've, you've walked. We can't be every place at once. So we repeat, repeat our, our routes and, um, and we're looking for birds, birds that are, are almost unnoticeable in the midst of the gigantic features of a downtown area. So part of being a volunteer is learning how to spot these birds because they're, um, you know, they're almost at times unnoticeable as, as they're, um, you know, hurt and laying at the sides of the buildings that we're, we're monitoring. We've got people on foot. We've got people in bikes. We've had people on scooters. Uh, we've got people covering as much ground uh, as early and often as they can. We uh, end our, our monitoring in the morning, but we know that birds can potentially uh, uh, strike buildings all day long. So we also have a network of people who can respond when the public or buildings let us know that there are birds at other times of the morning. We're out in the rain. It doesn't matter what the weather is. Birds actually, in some cases, are in, in worse condition if they've come down and hit a building and they're laying out exposed uh, to the rain. Uh, we're, we're going up ladders to get birds that are stuck on, um, on awnings in areas that we can't reach. Uh, we're going up in bucket trucks sometimes to get things uh, that, we, that uh, we need to reach inside of lobbies or other areas where birds uh, have gotten into trouble. Uh, in the one and a half mile square that we monitor, uh, we pick up anywhere from um, six to 7,000 birds a year. And we know that those birds that we find are, are just the tip of an iceberg. Uh, we find the birds that make it all the way to the ground. We know that rooftops and awnings and inaccessible areas throughout the downtown area have dead and injured birds that we cannot, cannot get to. Um, so if you multiply that 7,000 that we do in just the few hours that we're out to the entire day and uh, uh, every area of, of, um, of the Chicago lakefront, uh, you, can, you can know that there are tens of thousands of birds that are uh, hitting windows and the magnitude of that problem is, is evident from, from the numbers that we are finding. Uh, we're collecting the dead birds uh, in, this, uh, in order to make documentation of the kinds of birds, uh, the, the magnitude of the problem, the um, types of areas that are most dangerous by virtue of the number of birds that may be found in certain uh, uh, building designs and features. We are sorry that these birds have perished, but we are glad that they can be put to use in the Field Museum is such a wonderful partner for taking uh, what once again is tens of thousands of birds that we have given them over the 20 years that we've been doing this project. These birds, uh, instead of being thrown away, uh, can go to uh, contribute to uh, many studies, uh, co contribute to knowledge of their species, can be uh, have tissue sampling that can help us uh, learn more about them, about ways to protect them potentially, and learn more about our environment. When we're going after injured birds, we're using our um, collection nets, which are different varieties of butterfly, bird, and fishing nets to uh, get to a bird that's on the, laying on the sidewalk. Generally, they're found not very far from the window that they have hit. Uh, we're collecting them. We're getting them uh, safely picked up. Uh, we're putting them into paper bags, uh, which we clip shut and label with the information of, of where the bird was found, when it was found. Uh, if we know what kind of bird it is, we're marking that on there. Uh, people ask whether they can breathe in a paper bag. Uh, yes, they can. Paper bags are not airtight. And do we need to poke holes in the bag? No, we don't. Uh, they're quite fine traveling. They're dark and quiet and, and contained, and this gives them a space to sit in and be protected and hopefully quiet and undisturbed for what is a lot of a self-recuperation that they're, they're coming through from, from having um, sustained what in most cases for these birds is head trauma. Uh, they get spinal injuries because sometimes hitting their heads on a window, the, the, the shock goes down into, in, to increase spinal injuries. They can break their beaks. They can, um, they can break um, their wings. They can have uh, coracoid fractures and, and other injuries of, of that like. And I'm sure Justin will talk about that later. So uh, these birds, in, by and large, need to rest. They need to recuperate. And um, quiet and dark is the best place for them to, to be kept until they can... Um, be evaluated at Willowbrook. Uh, we use thicker bags for some birds because as this uh, 
Flickr shows, uh, he had the time and opportunity to drill his way uh, out of this paper bag. So sometimes we've got to use multiple bags or thicker bags for uh, a bird that may uh, try to escape from, from, from a paper bag. We, uh, as I said, we, we find almost 7,000 birds a year downtown. Um, uh, about 70% of them are dead, about 30% of them are injured. We find, uh, we've had busy days where we found six, 700 birds in a single day. The first week of October of, of this year, 2022, we uh, recovered a thousand birds in one week. Uh, 700 of those were dead, 300 of those were, were injured. Uh, we find birds from over 200 different species, from very common things like robins and cardinals, uh, birds that are frequently uh, found and sometimes resident in our area to uh, birds that are completely migratory uh, and not, uh, not residents of this area, things from golden wing warblers um, to, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Actually, here's, here's the most common birds we find or the most frequently found, uh, white-throated sparrow, Brown creeper, uh, hermit thrush is the thrush we find the most often. Uh, we also find um, uh, natural warblers, uh, Tennessee warblers is frequently found, common yellow throat, uh, slate colored junco, uh, golden crown kinglet, uh, Swainson's thrushes, uh, American woodcocks, uh, yellow breasted, ye uh, yellow bellied sapsucker. Um, Northern flicker, and uh, the warbler we probably find the most often is the oven bird. So those are the birds we find the most often, but then we find things that are extremely rare. Golden wing warblers, here's a Kentucky warbler we wouldn't find too often. Uh, yellow rail is actually something we find frequently, which is a, a bird seldom seen by bird watchers or in the wild. And one year we even found a, a painted bunting, unfortunately dead, but um, and everything that's moving through Chicago by virtue of, of what a uh, important migratory path uh, can, be, can be theoretically found at the buildings that we have downtown. We have volunteers that besides going out with morning teams are helping us with transport because we need these birds to go out to Willowbrook Wildlife Center. We need them to be picked up from buildings throughout the day from uh, people perhaps in other places in the city that have found injured birds. So we have a, a core of people who are also our transporters that are collecting birds and bringing them to the, uh, to the Willowbrook Wildlife Center. We also have a, a hotline that is maintained uh, 365 days a year, 24 seven, and we get about 10,000 phone calls a year to, to, to our hotline currently, um, it, all answered by volunteers. Uh, and when these calls come in, we have a network of people who are available to go out on a, a variety of, of, whether it's picking something up that someone already has secured and can't get it to Willowbrook, to birds that need to be caught, uh, Canada geese, hawks, We've got uh, aquatic rescues. Uh, there's Jim rescuing a, a pelican, um, Amer an American coot, swans. Uh, we have a whole variety of raptors. And these are other birds that are impacted perhaps not by collisions, but by other urban hazards, such as hitting power lines, fishing line entanglement, being hit by cars, uh, different varieties of traps, uh, being shot during hunting season and wounded, but not recovered. And birds that have, have been poisoned or um, um, in, in other ways impacted by the, the hazards that, that our urban environment really poses to these birds that we, that we try to live in harmony with. So our mission stands as, as collecting data for the purpose of documenting the, the dangers and the causes of collisions, uh, being able to raise awareness to these dangers by the, the people that we meet, by the, the buildings that we work with, by the, the public that we can uh, address architects, uh, builders and uh, promoting bird safe build lighting and lighting and design. We have have um, helped form and lead a group called Bird Friendly Chicago, which has written bird friendly design guidelines that we are asking the city of Chicago to implement as part of uh, uh, bird safety in the city. Uh, these guidelines that we developed have already been adopted in Evanston and Skokie. We are still waiting for Chicago to put these uh, uh, bird safe design guidelines um, that, that we work together with the Department of Planning to, to um, devise and, and uh, work out for the, you know, the best means of implementation. And uh, we're hoping that these, those next year will go into effect because we'd like to see Chicago leading 
the country, uh, besides bleeding for being the most dangerous potential for birds because of our lights and glass, we'd like to be a place that's that's implementing uh, better lighting and design features in, a, in our city. And we are working with cooperative relationships with buildings and uh, simply rescuing the birds that are found injured in the, in the urban setting. If you want to learn more about ways to uh, use make safer uh, designs at your workplace or home, our webpage has products, examples of buildings uh, that, that resources for what you could do when you do find birds. You can learn more about that. Uh, we do programs and presentations. So check us out on that on our webpage and uh, always keep our number to call us if we can help you with a, a bird that uh, has come into harm's way. And next, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce Sit Lolly, who has been, uh, well, she'll probably tell you how long she's been a volunteer with us. She has done downtown work with us, as well as uh, going out on some of those uh, SOS rescues, everything from ducks at McKinley Park to, to things downtown that, that need rescuing all hours of the night and day. And she's been uh, a volunteer helping us out for, for quite a while. And she's gonna share with you some of her experiences volunteering. Hi, I'm Lolly. Um, I've been a volunteer with uh, Chicago Bird Collision Monitors, I think since 2018. I first heard of um, Chicago Bird Collision Monitors through um, Peggy Novart Nature Museum. And I actually, pre-pandemic was um, helping, uh, I was a volunteer there uh, preparing uh, study skins, which a lot of them came from, unfortunately, the birds that, that would be found um, from window strikes downtown um, that Chicago Bird Collision Monitors would, would hand over. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to basically do, do basically my part in doing like both sides of volunteering, like finding the, the birds that, that hill building is also helping birds that, that need, you know, that still have a fighting chance, um, uh, that we wanted to take to, to the wildlife rehab center. Um, and I, I, I learned so much in my experience, um, working with, uh, all these different types of birds downtown. One of the main things that I learned and was shocked about is the magnitude of how many different birds really do hit windows um, downtown every migration season. Um, and yeah, I, I basically would see birds actively hitting windows um, on, on my morning walks downtown. And I also, for the most part right now, I've been um, responding to the hotline calls and I've, and I've basically seen all sorts of different uh, injuries that birds have sustained from from not only window strikes but pretty much all the things that that Anna has has named uh, earlier. Um, I've seen birds um, getting caught by nets. I've been I've seen um, larger birds um, hitting hitting uh, power lines uh, and and breaking breaking their wings or legs. Um, I've also seen. Uh, babies surviving and their and their parents like not being anywhere around probably you know ha having having died from some other some other like issues um and it's been it's been honestly like a really a really valuable experience working with all um all different types of birds um i mostly have been also responding to a lot of um of the the birds being injured on the south side um, and it's honestly like I, since I have a, the privilege of also you know like having a car and being able to um, basically volunteer my time uh, whenever whenever I'm available. Like um, I also didn't notice you know how many different birds would hit buildings or or get caught in different um, you know situations that that they can't get out of um, in my own in my own neighborhood. Um, so I've been responding to a lot of those different calls and, um, so far, you know, I, I've, I've honestly, like, I, I could see myself continue to do this work for the foreseeable future. And it's, it's also been an opportunity for me to like help educate my friends and like my communities, um, to talk to them about, you know, what they could do to, in their own home to, to prevent, uh, birds from hitting windows. Um, my, one of my recent experiences was here, um, at Pause Chicago, they're a, a pet, a, 
a pet care um, clinic. And they actually, they had a bird strike a window on their second floor. And I went to, to pick up that bird. And they, I mentioned that, because uh, they were asking what they could do to prevent in the future. And they said that they had stickers on their first floor windows, but they didn't on their second floor. So I was, you know, I basically was like, you know, um, you should probably just also put stickers on your, on your, on all your floors, you know, to prevent that, that's from keep happening. Uh, and so, you know, it's been also like one of my, one of my favorite, um, I guess, rescues has been uh, hawk rescues, um, just because, uh, you know, there's all different types of things like that, that could happen to them. So uh, I noticed that, I guess I learned that um, hawks could also eat um, small mammals and those mammals could be contaminated with poison, like rat poison. Um, and that's something I never thought about uh, that could happen. Um, and unfortunately, um, the the hawk that I rescued didn't make it. Um, and I guess it was it was one of my favorite uh, experiences because like it, it's just, there's so many different issues that are caused by urbanization and, and you know, humans uh, in the city that like, um, basically it just shows how we we got to be more like aware of like what of like the impact that we have on 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 urban ecosystems um so basically yeah in in that experience i learned a lot in like what we could do to prevent that type of thing in the future um you know not just not just uh putting putting up uh stickers in our windows but also um being more aware of like maybe I shouldn't be putting like rat poison out, right? Because then there, maybe there's other ways that I could control like pests and just all these different things that that, that are that we, we have to consider. And also um, some, of my, some of my other experiences with, with rescuing is rescuing um, domesticated ducks that people release out, out into the, into the, the lakes um, in, in the Chicago Park District parks. I, I honestly also that, that was another thing that like that was surprising to me because a lot of people tend to do that and I, I guess a lot of people when they especially during the pandemic maybe it seems would go out and buy you know domesticated ducks as like just to think that they had could have them as pets um and yeah they a lot of people just you know they learn that oh this is a huge responsibility maybe I can't have this pet like I'm just gonna go release it into the wild. It, you know, it's just all these different things like that just happen. Uh, it's been really interesting, but uh, it's also been really great to work with um, all the other volunteers because we kind of have a system of like almost tag teaming because if if I go pick out pick up a bird um, from a location and I can't keep it overnight, let's say, or you know, just to make sure that that the bird gets to the wildlife rehab center as soon as possible that within the next 24 hours. We also have other people that I could that I could take the birds to that will house them overnight, um, you know, as pickup locations for the next day. So it's been, it's been, it's been really fun um, to also uh, volunteer my time whenever I do have free time because I'm always like out and about. I work a lot, but I'm also out and about all the time. And even I guess I have a lot of different stories with like my friends, like where I'm like hanging out with them. And then, and then I'm like, oh, I'm going to go get this bird because it's like a, two blocks away from you, you know? So it's just been, it's just been, uh, I guess a really uh, interesting thing to talk about to my friends. And like, um, now all my friends know me as that bird person. And like a lot of my friends have also found, either found dead birds or or have rescued birds on their own. So it, it's just like, I guess it just has become a huge learning experience for like people that I'm in community with. So it's been really, it's been really cool. Thanks, Lolly. All right, and then I guess we will pass it on to Justin. Okay, everybody sees that nice and clear. So I am the wildlife care supervisor at Willowbrook Wildlife Center. I have been on staff for over 10 years now. I've been in the field of wildlife rehab for 
of 16 years. I think I started as a volunteer in 2006, something like that. So I've been doing it a while. And I do work at Willowbrook Wildlife Center. We are a native rehab facility. Um, we treat injured and orphaned wild animals. Uh, we are based out of DuPage County. We are part of the DuPage County Forest Preserve. So we're, we're, we're fairly unique in that, in that regard. We are a high volume center. So last year we had over 11,500 animals admitted to us. Uh, we're over 10,000 this year, 10,000 and counting. Um, so we are, we are one of the largest rehab centers in the country. I'm assuming, you know, probably the world, although, you know, I don't know that for sure. So of those patients, more than half of them are birds. In 2021, we had 7,164. Um, this year we're at, you know, 6,600, you know, that was as, as of this week. So we'll, we'll have a bit more before the year ends, but luckily it is slowing down, lucky for us. Um, of those patients, 4, 000, over 4,000 this year come from CBCM. So they are by far our biggest um, organization that brings us animals. And of those birds, 166 are, they represent 166 different species of bird. In that there are, includes 25 endangered or threatened species. If you guys know your, some of you will know your shortcuts there. So black-billed cuckoo, uh, least bittern, American bittern, upland sandpiper, black crown night heron. So far this year, we have released 3,352. I'm sure it's more as of today, because I didn't check today. I think there was a peregrine released fairly recently. Uh, the most common ones we get are a bunch of winter residents, American robin, mallard, Canadian goose, morning dove. But as you get down the list here, we start to see some of those um, common migrants that Annette, Annette talked about. Um, this year, we had, you know, the Tennessee warbler, creepers, kinglets, white-throated sparrow um, in pretty high numbers. And uh, resident, resident raptors or the red-tailed hawks. Uh, if we went down this list, you'd probably see great horns and uh, Cooper's hawks not far out, out of that. And the house finches. Okay, so the, the birds that come to us, these are the reasons the top reasons why they come to us. And by far, as you can see, the building window collision represents the, the largest amount. Um, the second to that is orphaned or felled from nest. Our, we definitely have a busy season and it, it starts with that spring migration and then uh, ends pretty much with the, the end of fall migration. And during that time, it is busy. Um, going down the list though, uh, common stuff you might think, you know, car collision, human interference. Um, I'm happy that number's not more because that essentially is kidnapping. Um, a lot of baby birds might not need, you know, they might have parents in the area. Uh, but there's, there's other reasons um, for human interference. Entanglement, of course, uh, we get a lot of great horned owls. They get stuck in soccer nets when they're hunting at night, come to us. Cat attacks. Um, which is pretty, you know, I, I'm actually surprised that number's not higher. That's what we know of, you know. Uh, dog attack, disease, fishing line is its own little category here. And gunshot, it's usually, you know, pellets. Somebody's shooting BBs at a goose. Um, up here in this picture we have, this was an oil spill goose. So this is one of our bathing, um, bathing things there. Okay, gonna keep moving. Rehabilitation process, this is intake, right? So we start with intake. Um, finders, CBCM, whoever um, brings us the animal. They are going to be greeted by one of our front desk staff, most likely. And they are going to get the history of the animal. They're gonna create them a medical chart. From there, they're gonna go into our triage area to see is these incubators, carriers, shoe boxes, it's just a quiet space. It can also provide heat support. We also have um, oxygen support that we can provide through these incubators and we have some other larger caging. Um, for those critical patients that we wanna get, we wanna get on uh, oxygen right away. 
This is also the intake we will um, flight test all those collision birds. Well, not all of them, um, but the ones that appear healthy, we're going to give them um, a flight test as part of their, their precursory exam here. So this is that bottom picture, those paper bags. Um, a lot of our staff, I mean, I still consult the books, um, been doing it a while. Um, so it's definitely like a learning curve for any of our new staff to learn all these different bird species. Uh, they're also going to get their, we have Dr. Sarah and Mike doing an exam on a bald eagle. Um, and I passed over triage. We were definitely going through and seeing the condition of these patients. Um, there are some with such severe injuries that euthanasia is going to be that best option for them. Um, and those are, those are pretty obvious. I didn't include any of those, those pictures there. They're, they're pretty terrible. Um, so that is definitely one of those things is, is a triage is, is truly just prioritizing your patients. So who needs, you know, the, the attention right away, right? So sometimes that is, that is just euthanasia to relieve suffering. Our wonderful clinic staff, um, we have two, two staff vets and we just hired a vet tech, um, We'll then start, they will go into the, the whole exam and treatments. And this is um, a whole presentation on its own, um, but includes things like wound management. Uh, if they suspect a fracture for other reasons, we can do what are called plop rads, where that's really cool. You can just get, a, you don't have to sedate the animal or anything like that. You can wrap them in a towel or something like that. And you can just plop them right on the x-ray table and get an x-ray. And here you can see, um, we have a goose. It looks like it was shot through. It's got three pellets in there at least. Um, so plop reds are great. Blood work, uh, if we're concerned about um, some sort of toxin. Lead is definitely one of those things out there that we test for. You see it commonly. The more you test for it, the more you're going to find it. Um, we have this red tail hawk here. He actually received a blood transfusion. Um, we have PCV that's at pack cell volume, the hematocrit. Um, blood count really low. We, if we have other red tail hawks, which we almost always do in our care, we can get blood from one of them and we can transfuse it in this patient. And it is a miracle worker for these, for these guys. Also, you're going to see, this is where we're going to be doing our medications, prescribing medications, a lot of pain management. You're seeing a lot of meloxicam, which is an anti-inflammatory. So you're talking all those birds that are hitting buildings, they have swelling, they have pain, they have head trauma. Uh, Annette mentioned the spinal trauma. So we use gabapentin, which is great for that. You're also gonna, of course, for your wounds, your cat attacks, especially, you wanna make sure they, they get a course of antibiotics. For some of our real high stress species, we'll actually keep them sedated while they're inside to prevent themselves from uh, further injuring themselves. Um, most of the time that tends to be mammals, but um, I think they do use it sometimes in some of the birds, larger birds. Um, the chelation therapy, that refers to the lead. Um, if, if we have high lead levels, you need to bind that lead and get it out of their body. So that's where those drugs come into, come into play. All right, we have another picture of the lovely Dr. Sarah. She's doing some laser therapy there on a uh, the red tail hawk patient. So uh, laser therapy, physical therapy, surgery. I have on there amazing orthopedics because our vets um, have really, uh, they do a lot to keep up, keep up to practice with uh, orthopedic surgeries so they can heal a lot of injuries that we, we previously could not. Um, so they will pin fractures, um, stabilize them. Those, those patients um, are often, you know, most often released too. Um, they just, they might take a while in our rehab process, but um, it is kind of amazing. We're always, mon they're always monitoring for parasites, um, doing fecals, um, so we can make sure we, you know, <laughs> reduce our, at least reduce the parasite load in our, in our patients. And they're always monitoring, make sure our patients are progressing, that they're getting better, that what we're doing is working, reevaluating that process. All right, so what are we feeding all these animals? We are feeding them all kinds of things. Um, sometimes we have to assist feed them, um, which actually a lot of our patients that come to us in bad shape, they're not gonna eat. They have really bad spinal trauma. We might have to force feed them. Um, a lot of those lead, uh, lead neuro, neuro geese that come to us, um, they don't wanna eat the first week or two that they're with us. So we might actually you know, put a gavage tube down their esophagus and force feed them. 
Uh, of course, our raptors, um, we have to feed them what they eat. So that's mice, quail, rats. Um, our fish eaters, we generally feed them smelt. Uh, so whole fish. Of course, birds love insects. They're uh, a huge part of bird diets. So we're feeding them mealworms, waxworms, crickets, earthworms. This one is, this is a soil pan for the woodcock, right? So we got um, probably like six ounces of worms in there covered up with leaves. Uh, the woodcock can go ahead and forage in there. You'll see, you know, over here, we have a lot of the chopped fruit, chopped seed. This is basically a demo plate. And this little, this is a pelleted diet we make. We mix it up with fruits and veggies and, and pre-make it, we can freeze it. It allows us just to give us a base um, to then add all these other different things that they, they probably like better, but they do get some of that and it is a balanced diet. It's a Missouri insectivore pellets. They have a whole range of different commercial diets. Okay, and hope everybody loves these spreads. My coworker does amazing, amazing food prep uh, presentation here. So you'll see we have like duck chow, mealworms and waxworms, chopped greens, uh, chopped fish, chopped shrimp. So food presentation um, for our birds, we'll put it on these hanging platforms so they can go and jump on there and feed. Okay, orphans, orphans are their own thing. They're their own presentation. Uh, so I didn't, didn't do a whole lot about them. They are super time staff intensive. Um, the small nestlings, we're gonna feed them every 20 to 30 minutes. This is a little baby hummingbird. Stephanie actually had this picture. Um, they're ridiculous to take care of. So <laughs> they're, their, they're their own thing. Little baby killdeer. Killdeer are great, uh, super high stress, also fairly difficult to take care of. Uh, all the songbirds, except for doves and finches, they're going to be fed insects in those early stages. So that presents its own challenges. How many mealworms and waxworms can we possibly get in crickets? And then you got to make sure they have the right vitamins. Um, so it's their own thing. Waterfowl, we get a lot of baby mallards, geese, uh, wood ducks, etc. So they're their own. They're their own. Uh... Okay, I'm going to keep rolling, yeah? Okay, so for our housing, I always tell everybody rehab is just a progression from a smaller, it's, it's all a progression. It's, it's a smaller to larger space when it comes to housing. Um, as, as they come into us, they need more intensive care. They're in smaller spaces. They may have fractures. They don't feel good. They need heat support. They're in these small spaces. We're spending a lot more time with them. As they heal their injuries, or in the case of orphans, they get bigger, you wanna move them up to a bigger space where they can do their natural behaviors, right? Um, we have all types of things we do for housing with all these different species. Um, we'll use whatever we can. We have boxes with lights and, and heat lights in here and hide spots for them. Um, for our raptors, we'll often do tail guards so they don't bust their, their tail feathers. We have pools for waterfowl. We do all kinds of variety of perches and things like that. We run um, at white noise. You know, we have sound machines. We'll, we'll run some bird song. Um, and other things, just trying to keep them, you know, comfortable. More housing. So we have incubators. This is a duck setup. Even for a little shallow water pan, we give them a little ramp because we're talking tiny little babies might use that. Um, we have these cages where we provide um, oxygen for them. We always have towels over the front of those open face cages so they can't see us. We are big, scary predators to these birds. They do not know we're trying to help them. Help, you know, they, they, people will often say that, but they have no idea you're trying to help them. They think you're going to kill them. Um, so always keep that in mind if you come across wildlife. Um, they don't know. They have no context for this. So the, the best thing you can do, quiet space, get them to the hospital where they can start their treatment. As you can see here, we got a flicker on one of these. They're vertical perchers, so we got to give them that perch. We got to give them that bark that they can, they can cling on there. And we have, a, we have a pool in our loading dock for diving ducks, which includes this little grebe right here. And he has some live goldfish he was chasing around. He did, he did wonderfully. All right, and as they move along, they get to go outside. They get to go outside to the big, the big pond. This is where all our geese are. This is a winter picture. So there's all these heating elements and other things. Um, raptors ultimately go out to our raptor flight facility. Um, like this snowy owl here where you get that slatted enclosure um, allows us to rehabilitate um, our larger raptors. We're actually getting a larger raptor center, which is needed for our bigger birds and because we get so many of them. 
Um, this is just a, you know, these dead pine trees. This is inside of a flight cage for songbirds, right? So they can, they can get their full exercise before they're released. They can get acclimated to the weather um, and things like that. And we're hardly in there. We're just in there to clean and feed once or twice a day in and out, uh, they can do all their natural behaviors. So after these stages, this is um, hopefully after this, uh, they will get released. And our release, we're looking for all their injuries healed, that they're behaving appropriate for the species. Um, for those birds, we want to make sure they can lift real strong from the ground up and that they have good stamina. They can go back and forth without huffing and puffing, open mouth breathing, that type of thing. We want to make sure they're weather acclimated. We will do releases like this great horned owl in the winter. Um, as long as they have been outside, they are birds that are out here. You know, they are year round residents. So we, we will release them in the winter. Obviously we don't do it during a, you know, a polar vortex maybe, um, but we will release them in the winter. Our birds do get banded, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife bands. We put, the, put on them um, before release. We are migratory. The, a lot of the CBCM birds that are flying through, they're migratory. We're going to release them on site. We have a nice little forest preserve with food, hide spots, things like that, um, that they can hang out on and then, you know, go, upon their, go, on, go on their way. We do try to get birds released back to where they're found in a lot of situations, especially if it's nesting season, they had a mate. Um, these raptors have territories. Um, they have a family or a social group. Um, we're always working and trying to try find out more, you know, when it comes to like corvids, getting them back to their, their family. So we're always trying to, trying to do that. Okay, how did I do on time? Perfect. Um, Good? That's perfect. I think okay. we're ready to move on to Stephanie. Yeah, I will stop sharing my screen. Stephanie, are you here? So my name is Stephanie. I um, have been volunteering with Willowbrook since October of 2017. Um, and I'm just gonna talk really briefly about you know, the aspects and the roles that volunteers play when it comes to caring for animals at Willowbrook. Um, I'm, I think it's hard to get a good grasp of um, what goes on and what we deal with um, by just talking about it. So I'm including some photos and videos along with what I'm saying so you can get a better idea. So um, here we have a few of our patients, um, a lot of orphans, uh, kestrel, a couple of house finches, a gull, and then there's a snowy owl from earlier this year. Um, a major component of volunteering is obviously cleaning. We clean all cages and enclosures daily. Um, this can be anything from hosing down outdoor enclosures. Like you can see on the left, we have our orphaned mallards that Justin was talking about. They make a big mess, so we have to hose that down daily. Sometimes twice a day, we'll do water changes for them. Um, we also take care of animals in an indoor setting where we're scrubbing walls and changing towels and use papers for patients that are still being treated by um, clinic staff or just are housed indoors instead. I know the bunny is not a bird, I apologize. <laughs> and then here, um, sometimes we have some animals that are very large and need a larger space than we can provide for them. So I just have this quick video of a couple of swans that we had a couple of winters ago. Put the load. So as you can see, they need a much larger space than we're able to provide in cages. And um, it's just a lot of fun being able to clean those spaces. Another huge aspect is um, feeding the animals. Uh, we ensure patients are receiving appropriate food by following diet cards um, that have been created by staff. Obviously, there's a broad range of birds that we deal with, so they can be eating anything from like seeds to berries to worms, like Justin said, to rodents. Um, and then we also have situations where some of the animals just aren't interested in what we're offering, um, in which case we're kind of 
coordinating with staff to kind of figure out what we can give them that's a little bit more enticing. Um, an example I have here is this top middle photo of a kingfisher. They don't usually enjoy the thought out smelt we try to offer them. Um, so we do offer them live goldfish occasionally and that does usually seem to help. Um, and then depending on the time of year, we also do try to forage on Willowbrook property, especially for our orphaned um, birds and squirrels. Uh, we will try to kind of get plants and berries that they may encounter once they're finally released and ready to go out. So you can see here we have a um, juvenile cardinal with some elderberry and then some goldfinches with some flowers and seeds that we provide for them off of our site. And then here we have a few orphaned um, black crown night herons. And they are very messy, but they are fed multiple times a day. So this was first thing in the morning, they're getting their first fish. Um, And they would obviously be cleaned. And as fun as it is to clean and feed all these guys, there is one challenging aspect when it comes to dealing with birds and that is their ability to fly. Um, as you can see on the photo on the right, this is in our bird nursery, it's our canopy where we house a lot of the migratory birds that are being treated by the clinic staff at Willowbrook. Um, it's just nice to have a more enclosed space because many times we do have birds that escape on us. I know if you ask any volunteer who is done with their first day in bird nursery, they'll say something along the lines of like, I had a great time, but I let out like three birds, which actually isn't too bad. Um, so here I have a video. We had a few orphan hummingbirds and injured hummingbirds. Um, these two were unable to fly, but there was one every time we would clean the enclosure that would just always escape. He just slipped out immediately the second you cracked open the door. So you can just see he's up here flying. So we do spend a lot of time catching birds occasionally. So that gives you kind of a good aspect of what the majority of the responsibilities are for volunteering, but I would argue that my favorite part is obviously releasing the animals. Um, obviously that's kind of the whole point of all of this. We want them to be rehabilitated and released back into the wild. So these are just a few photographs um, within the past year. This first top photo on the left was actually my first release. I believe it was a red-tailed hawk um, at Hidden Lake. But the other ones have all been released within the past year. We have a great horned owl, sandhill crane, a bittern, and a couple of red-tailed hawks. And then you can see, um, I know we spoke earlier about CBCM and how some animals just kind of need a few minutes to recuperate and don't actually need any kind of medical care. Um, so we are actually able to release birds at our site, like Justin said earlier. And here's a volunteer releasing, I'm not sure what bird it was, but we're releasing a few of the um, birds that have come from CBCM and will be continuing their migratory oh. flight. And then this video would be that great horned owl we just saw in the photo previously. And yeah, that's, that's all I have. All right, thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you to our presenters. Uh, we'll start with some question and answer. And just as a reminder, if you could keep yourself on mute so our speakers can answer. Um, the first question is for Annette. Um, you showed a, a graph with data going up to 2014. Um, how does the data look after 2014? 
things have continued. I mean, that's uh, an example. Of, I mean, the, the patterns are the same spring and fall. We haven't seen any diminishment, if anything, with more help and volunteers. We're, our, our numbers have gone up because of the more birds we're able to get to. Uh, the patterns, though, as far as peak season and times in, in the spring and fall, uh, continue to continue to stay the same. We're uh, a little bit worried about climate change in the sense that will there be a time at some point when birds are migrating year round because the weather never really shifts as much and we're going to have birds that we're encountering all the time. Um, but uh, birds use a lot, uh, they, their migration is um, highly dependent on uh, daylight hours and that's not changing. The sun hasn't changed on us yet. So the daylight hours that they're using to decide on their migrating times uh, kind of hold pretty hard and fast. And there's just different periods that you can find during migration where we know the flickers are all coming now. We know it's, you know, the woodcocks, it's time for the woodcocks to show up. So those patterns have, have certainly continued. All right, thank you. And another question for you, Annette, uh, what can people do to help implement rules and regulations uh, at the city level? I, oh, that would be me again. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're, we're trying to uh, have people, if, if you live in the city and you can uh, write to your uh, alderman, to the mayor, uh, we ha have been waiting since Chicago in, in uh, 20, early 2020 passed the idea that these bird-friendly guidelines would be uh, required, but uh, we've been put off for several years and uh, we were told next year in 2020, we were told next year in 2021, and now in 2022, we've been told next year. Uh, if by next year, we still don't see that the Department of Planning has put these things in place, we're very concerned that every year that we wait, another building goes up and that building will stand for decades, killing birds and re certainly retrofitting a building after the fact is uh, often very challenging, impossible, and certainly way more expensive than if the forethought of adding the materials and design that will make it bird friendly. We, we have the ability to do this. It's not um, something that's in, impossible. There are ways to make buildings bird safe. And we're trying to impress that on, on architects, developers, owners of homes, that the more products we get out there, the more ways we can make things safe right from the start. And those things will contribute to uh, energy savings, most of the things that are bird friendly about a building are also um, energy savers and they're part of sustainability plans. So we want to see this move forward and uh, just not have, have a time when we would build a building that wouldn't be um, bird safe if, if we have that within our capacity. So uh, we'll, if you pay attention to our web page and to the Bird Friendly Chicago page at the point that we feel that we need to take more action than seeing the city implement this, we'll, we'll post things to people and to different bird clubs to try to get action on the fact that we think it is, it's high time um, that the Chicago be a leader in this. As they're a leader in architecture, we want to see them be a leader in bird bird safe design. And we have spoken with the casino uh, uh, designers and developers, and they are saying that they are going to take bird friendly design under consideration as part of being a good neighbor and a good good part of Chicago. So we're, we're very hopeful for that because that casino is going to be built on the Chicago River, right where we have several other buildings that are that have massive numbers of bird strikes. So if that casino is built without bird friendly design, we know it's in a location where it's going to be incredibly deadly. Thanks, Annette. Um, the next few questions are for Justin. Do you give medications twice daily or once to limit handling, and do you use primarily injectable medications? Uh, no, typically they're or oral medications. We will definitely do two times a day med medications. Sometimes it, it's really needed. Um, so you, you're always, uh, depends on species, right? So you're always trying to balance stress of handling versus medications. Um, but a, a lot of those medications need to be given, given twice a day. And orally, it's pretty easy. We get compounded stuff um, and like a sweet syrup, um, especially like raptors and things like that. They're going to open up their mouth and, and kind of do their scary face. And you can just, you know, shoot some meds in there. For the little birds, it's the tiniest amount. It's like a drop or two. And you, a lot of those, the tiny, the small songbirds, you definitely, if you can, just medicate them once, handle them once in a day. You can actually just drop a little bit on their beak um, and they'll actually lap that up. So. And speaking of our small songbirds, is it possible to do surgery on them? Or is that really only something you can do with larger species like raptors and waterfowl? Well, our vets are always pushing their boundaries. I think we're looking at a robin size for any sort of surgery. 
Now, with that said, a lot of these little guys are going to heal with just a, a, a tape, uh, paper tape bandage and some, some time, some time in a, a small space. We just use carriers, right? Um, and they can heal from, from all these broken, uh, broken wings, cor you know, coracoids, clavicles, wing injuries, um, wing fractures. They can heal from these um, with just a little bit of time in a small space. So you don't necessarily need those to pin. Whereas you get in your larger species, they, a lot of times those fractures are so bad, they need to be aligned properly. So they need to, they'll put a, you know, birds have those you know, lovely hollow bones, as they say, right? You can, they can put a pin through those, right? Um, to make sure that heals appropriately. So I think, I think we're at Robin's house. Okay, and we did just have a question come in about fixing uh, broken, broken bones, since yeah. they have hollow bones. It's, it's doable. Yeah, oh no, it's, it's um, you know, you can, you can heal quite a bit. When it is really severe, it's old or open, um, those tend to be the cases that won't heal properly. But fresh fractures, you can heal quite a bit, you'd be kind of amazed. Um, but yeah, as it gets old, you know, if it's, if it's been a while, it's probably healed improperly. Um, so a lot of those guys don't make it. Uh, the next question, Justin, uh, this person heard that Willowbrook is expanding. Does that include yeah. the clinic? Oh yeah. Um, we have an exciting master plan. So we, um, they're starting already. So we're, our Raptor barn is being built, um, areas for, we do have permanent residents. So, uh, enclosures for them are being built. They're going to move off trail which we have a small outdoor trail, which you can visit for a little while longer, not very long, because um, they're going to be demolishing those old cages and building, uh, putting a new clinic facility in there. So we're really excited about it. Um, and I should mention, uh, Robin threw a link in the chat for uh, if you wanted to donate to CBCM. Um, Justin, is there uh, any way to donate to um, the cause at Willowbrook? Um, yeah, you can go through the forest preserve, um, dupageforest.org, um, and donate that way. I don't think we have, um, I don't have our specific link to donate, you know, directly through Willowbrook. They tend to, it tends to all go into one pool when you donate, because we are part of the forest preserve. Um, so that's how that works usually. Okay, great. Um, and then just to mix it up, I have a, some questions for our volunteers. Can you tell me about your most rewarding uh, rescue or rehab patient? Um, well, I guess we can start with Lolly. I can remember like one of my first experiences with uh, rescuing um, a woodpecker. Um, I remember seeing a, a wood, uh, I think it was a, a, a flicker that hit a window downtown. Um, and it was it was it was hard to see because it was like one of my first experiences like rescuing birds. But also, I remember seeing how much like trauma the 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 woodcock was or the um the, the woodpecker was experiencing because like there were there was like significant blood coming out of its nose and like it just didn't look too active and it, it was not doing too well, you know. Because like for a bird to be sh like showing injury and like and like being very inactive and like literally like not even able to stand up means that it's very you know, very significantly, like going through trauma, and I remember putting this bird, you know, in a bag and and having it taken to the to the wildlife uh, rehab center. And I guess I heard at the end of the year we had a um, a party where uh, a bird party basically at the field museum, and they gave us a sheet of paper um, of the birds that we that we rescued and like what what ended up happening to them. Um, and that bird that that flicker that I rescued actually was able to be released into the wild and you know that that showed me like how how actually resilient they are to these window strikes a lot of times because people think that you know birds are very they are really really delicate creatures but also they are very resilient and and they have their own ways of adapting to you know these harsh environments amazing uh stephanie do you have a memorable or rewarding patient i think my personal favorite and most rewarding ones would probably be like the orphaned owls. Um, they're just with us for such a long time um, because they take so much longer to grow. You kind of see them from when they're very small and as they're gradually pro progressing from being hand fed to eating on their own to being out in the raptor flight facility. Um, that's just the most rewarding to get to kind of see the entire process. 
great. Thanks. Um, okay, I think this one will probably go back to Justin. Uh, for young nesting uh, songbirds without feathers, uh, do you have a good survival rate? I've heard uh, different different things. Totally depends on species. So we with robins, we're probably somewhere around 70%. So I do sort of like our husbandry numbers on how we raise. And that's our most common one. It also, there's a lot of factors that go into it though. Did they just hatch out? Like, are they totally naked and, and real young? Were they dehydrated, bruised, et cetera? Um, of course, it, our success rate does go up with weight. Um, but there are some species that are just, are very difficult to do at such a small, small age. You know, we're always trying to improve that. Um, goldfinches tend to be a difficult one. Um, there's, there's just some we get that, uh, and sometimes it's not even naked, you know? Um, but yeah, it's just very species dependent. Okay, thanks. Um, and are there volunteer opportunities uh, such as at Willowbrook in the city? <laughs> no, the, well, so the city doesn't have their own rehab center. They, they really should, right, Annette? <laughs> um, but yeah, there, I don't know of volunteer opportunities like Willowbrook's really unique. Uh, it, like I said, it, I mean, we're one of the larger centers. It's, it takes a lot to do this. Um, and we have a lot of volunteers that come to us from the city, actually. Uh, because it's a, it's a, it's a pretty unique and it just takes a lot to be able to do this. So I don't know of any in the city. So I used to live in the city and I would commute out for my volunteer day. I would volunteer in animal care in the morning and clinic in the afternoon. And it was always my favorite day of the week. Um, so, but that's, you know, it's not easy for everybody. Um, and, and speaking of uh, coverage, Annette, uh, do you pick up injured birds outside of the city such as Evanston, for example? Oh yeah, um, we pick up birds in the greater Chicago area, every place from as far south as Piatone up to Waukegan and Zion. So we get calls from you know, uh, suburban homes, businesses. Um, like I said, the, the, it's about 7,000 birds that we pick up in the downtown area. But then for everything we pick up in all the surrounding areas, every year we, have anywhere from eight to 10,000 birds that, that we recover. So uh, we are finding uh, birds that, that need help uh, throughout the whole Northern Illinois area. Okay, and the next question that we have, um, maybe to Justin, I don't know if you could comment on this, um, about protecting birds from West Nile virus. Well, it's been, it's been out there for a while. Um, yes, it definitely hit hard when it, when it kind of first showed up in the area, you saw it and it hit certain species. Um, I think they have in the chat there, crows, corvids, um, raptors. As far as wild birds, there's not, you know, I mean, mosquito abatement, um, a lot of the townships do that already. Um, the big thing is not leaving standing water. Um, but as far as, as protecting the birds, it's, it's part of, it's out there, right? And there's not much you can do besides, you know, um, trying to eliminate standing water as far as I know of. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's, that's common. We see a lot in the later summer. It, it, it tends to depend on weather too, but we'll see it, it hits red tail hawks a lot, um, where you almost assume it's West Nile because of the way they're acting and they're presenting. Um, but we can treat it and a lot of them get through it. Um, so there, there is that a lot of them can get through it. Okay, um, and then can you tell us a little bit more about the Willowbrook expansion? Specifically, will the new building be bird friendly? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that would be terrible to go through all this and have an exhibit area where we talk about collision birds and other such injuries and then have them hitting our window. Yes, that is uh, that was on the foremost of design. We are uh, going to be a net zero building as well. Um, so it is, uh, there is a lot that goes into that. The, when doing this construction process, the engineers of the construction company were floored by how much energy we used. So it was always like, you know, all these incubators, they use a lot of heating pads and such. They use a lot of energy. 
Um, so that was just all part of the process. We were, the staff has been part of the entire process in the design. Um, so it's very much on our, you know, on our mind. You never want, I mean, you don't want to think that you're taking away habitat to build buildings, you know, nobody wants to do that. So this was all very, um, you know, always on the forefront of our minds when, when going through this process. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's it for, for questions, um, unless anyone has, wants to throw in one more. Um, but I just wanted to give Annette and Justin an opportunity if you are looking for volunteers um, this year or next year, if you wanted to mention that and, and how people can get involved. Yeah, I'd like to say that we can never have enough people. Uh, we always have more places we can go and more birds we can help. And I, I really wanted a chance to also just to say um, how very proud I am to work with the volunteers in our group. It's a, it, if you volunteer with us, it's a, it's a great group of people. Everyone's doing it for the right reason. They're out there to help these birds and they're getting up at inc incredibly crazy hours and going out in the middle of the night and doing crazy things. But um, they're, they're really people who are, are, are so dedicated. And I'm, I'm so proud that we have the partnership that we do with the, the Field Museum and with, with Willowbrook Wildlife Center because their expertise, and as, as you can see from tonight, um, the, the quality of care and, uh, and support that we get from Willowbrook Wildlife Center and um, it, it is what helps us uh, grow and, and do as well as we have. So thanks to our volunteers, Willowbrook and, and partners in the birding community, uh, we've been able to grow and it, it's all those, those cooperative relationships um, are so important and, and very valued. And I, I can't thank all the people that help us accomplish what we do enough. So thanks, thanks to everyone who's helped us in the, in the past and going into the future. Yeah, for us at Willowbrook, uh, for volunteering, you can go through the website. It's through the Forest Preserve. Um, we do take volunteers year round. Of course, we need more when we ramp up for that spring migration and baby season. So, you know, April through October, we have a big volunteer need. And I would definitely echo and I would I would say if you, if you need to donate, donate to CBCM. Um, Annette needs, uh, <laughs> needs some time off sometimes. Um, <laughs> they are amazing. Uh, they are, they are absolutely amazing. Volunteer run and they have become the rescue organization for the Chicago land area. Um, so it is a huge task that they take on. It is amazing. Justin is just saying that because it's job security. That's what we <laughs> like to say. <laughs> <laughs> we will not stop bringing things to you. Yeah, there, there is that. I don't know what else I would do. <laughs> could slow down. <laughs> yeah. Always good for Thank a slow. <laughs> yes, and that's providing a lot of customers. Yes. All right. Thank you, uh, everyone, so much for participating tonight. Thank you so much to our speakers. I think we will wrap up. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, just a reminder, it's the end of the year, which means it's membership renewal time at COS, so please consider renewing or joining COS. Your membership dues do help us provide all sorts of free programming, like what you saw tonight, as well as field trips. We also work on advocacy and conservation projects in the Chicago area. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you so much, Annette, Lolly, Justin, and Stephanie. Have a good evening. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye.